All right. Thank you for coming. We know it's a difficult time of year. Um, so we appreciate you being here with us. Um, we are going to talk about data, collect, bleh, data collection and analysis. Um, I did make that this PowerPoint while we've been on the road a lot and I've made it in a hotel room. So I know there are some mistakes on here. I apologize. We'll get through it though. We will, we will get through it. So we're going to do quick introductions. We're going to just do really quick. What is data? Why do I need to collect data? We're going to take a little sidebar into defining behaviors and skills, and then we will get into the meat of collecting and analyzing data. So I am Jennifer Gleason. Um, like the rest of the team, I was a special education teacher before joining the Department of Education three years ago. And Colette Sullivan is our fearless leader, and she is unable to be here today. But we have Carly Thibodeau. Hi, I'm Carly Thibodeau, and I joined this team almost two years ago. And before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. Ashley. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Ashley Statry, and I have been, I'm the newest member of the team, but I've joined almost a year ago now. So coming up on my one year anniversary on the team. Um, and before I joined the team, I was a teacher here in Maine and in Virginia doing various things in special ed. Awesome. And our Wrangler extraordinaire. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. Um, I have been with the DOE. I'm in my seventh year. Excuse me. And prior to that, I was um, admin support at a K-5 elementary school for 16 years. Thanks, Julie. Sure. All right. This is just a um, visual for alignment throughout the IEP. So we talk a lot about this. Um, it is related to data. So I put this in here um, just as a reminder that the flow of the IEP each section connects um, and is directly aligned with the next section. And this is just a nice little visual to remind us of that. So quickly, what is data? We use data every day, all day. So these are just some things I thought of in like five minutes in a hotel room of data that we use in our day-to-day -day life, right? How fast are we going? What's the speed limit compared to how fast I'm going? Um, is my gas gauge empty or full? What's the temperature going to be so I can decide what to wear today? That's all data that we are using every single day to drive our day, drive right? We're deciding what we do based on this data. So what about in terms of education? So in general ed, the data are grades, could be work products, um, test or project scores, your curriculum assessment scores, MTSS, there's a lot of data around it involved in MTSS and your state and local assessments. Special education is all of that. Plus we have our evaluation data that we use to determine eligibility. We have baseline and goal measurement and progress monitoring. And today we are gonna focus on these two things, our baseline and goal measurement and progress monitoring. All right, so why do we need to collect and analyze data? Um, legal reasons, basically. So I'm guessing most of you know about the Andrew F case. This was in um, 2017. There was a student, there is a student, but he was in um, Colorado in an elementary school um, in the autism classroom, and he wasn't making any progress. His IEP was the same year to year. And when he was going into fifth grade, his parents rejected the IEP and placed him in a private school that specializes in 
working with students with autism. And he started to make progress in that school. So the parents filed due process to get reimbursed for tuition. And at that time, the standard was merely more than de minimis. So any progress is progress. The teeniest, tiniest bit of progress, that's okay, that counts. So um, the hearing officer found in favor of the school district because merely more than de minimis. So the um, parents appealed to the district court, to the circuit court, they all agreed with the hearing officer. Parents appealed to the Supreme Court and they said, nope, slow your roll, this isn't okay. Um, every child has the right to make progress, right? And the right to work on challenging objectives, right? And their goals should be reasonably calculated to enable them to make progress. So this is about, it's about using your data directly related to this. And it's also about calculating your goals so that they're achievable in one year for this child. So your data, we're gonna talk about this in a little bit, in a few minutes, but your data will tell you this student isn't making progress. And at that point, you need to change something, right? If they're not, if they're not making progress, it's not on them, right? It's on us as teachers um, to change the way we're teaching or change the materials we're using or something. Your data will tell you when you need to do that. You do it, hopefully things happen. If they don't, maybe you have to change something else, but you keep working at it until you find a way that that student is making progress. So if you think about this in terms of Andrew F, we don't know what his team was doing, but I gotta believe if they were using their data to drive their programming, they wouldn't have gotten into the pickle they got into. Um, this is a more recent case. This is from last year, 2023. And I'm not gonna get into the um, specifics of the case, but there is a link um, to some information about it there if you're interested. But the important thing is that the court identified defects in the IEP, including outdated data and vague language. And that resulted in substantive losses to the child and the parents. They were also weren't implementing like they should have been, but um, the court looked at their data and their goals and they found for the parents because there were some flaws in the um, in the IEP that they used outdated data. So that is why we need to take, collect and analyze data. But in order to do that, you need to know what kind of data you're taking. What are, what, what is the behavior or skill that you're tracking this data on, right? And in order to do that, you need to define them. So we see these kind of things a lot right? We see them a lot in gen ed, but also in special ed. Um, so anybody have any ideas on how you could measure these things? You can put it in the chat box, you could be brave and come off mute. Any ideas how you would measure these things? I think for safe body, if we were to say something like that in a goal, we would put a parentheses and that that would measure um, hands to themselves. Um, you know, so you would we, define what that means, right? We would define what safe body looked nice. like in the goal for that student. For that student, uh, you just perfectly segued into my next slide. Thank you. <laughs> Love that. Yes, these things are going to look different for different children, right? They're just too vague. They're not really, they're not defined. 
So I took participate in group activities and I made three definitions to that. So if you look at these, these are all really different de definitions. So if I see participate in group activities in a goal, I have no idea what that means for this child, right? They're really, really different. And there's probably, if you have a hundred kids, you probably have a hundred definitions of participation. It looks different for everyone. So my question here, I know you didn't know this was gonna be so interactive, but um, my question here is looking at these definitions, what do you see here that you would categorize as a skill? What things do you see in here that you would say, oh, that's a skill? The ability to remain at a table to complete an assignment. Um, the ability to request help as needed mm -hmm. uh, or ask for a break as yep. needed. Those are the two I see. I'm glad you're here, Diane. <laughs> I know it's hot and everybody's tired. So, so these are the skills I see. Um, I'm going to say... I'm going to disagree with you, Diane, and feel free to push back. Um, <laughs> that sitting in your chair is not a skill. So there's this thing BCBAs use. It's called the dead man's test. And if a dead man can do it, it's not a behavior. Everything else is a behavior. But if a dead man can do it, it's not a behavior. So if you took a dead man and put him in a chair, could he stay there? 100%. Yes, he could. He wouldn't do anything else, but he would stay there. So that's doesn't pass the dead man's test. It's not a behavior. Does that make so sense? You would invite me to push back. I guess if a student yep. individualized by the team, if they were a student that used to run around the classroom mm -hmm. and then they are now at a place where they need to be able to attend because they're getting older or it was just defined by the team that uh, being able to attend at a table mm -hmm. was appropriate for them, then could that still be considered? Although I hear what you're saying. I, I remember that dead man's test, but I didn't yeah. remember it in this case. <laughs> so in that case that you're talking about, you would think about what are you teaching the child? You're not teaching them to stay in their chair. You're teaching them some kind of self-regulation skills or, you know, coping mechanisms or um following a visual schedule that kind of thing so that's what you're teaching those are the skills that will have this outcome of the child can now sit in the chair does that make sense awesome you're just you're doing a great job of making this <laughs> whole thing flow this is great love this um so you're going to measure the skill you are teaching. That's what it comes down to. Your data is going to be around the skill you're teaching. It's not going to be around sitting in the chair. It's going to be around, is this child utilizing this visual schedule? Are they utilizing this um, token board? Something. That's what you're measuring in your goals. So before we get to actual data collection and analysis, do we have any questions? I'm working on my skill of waiting. There aren't any in the chat just now, but. Okay. Well, I am going to move on, but feel free to throw questions in the chat or just interrupt me. And that is absolutely fine because I like a conversation as you have noticed. All right. So the first thing is if you are Making a data sheet and you have an ed tech that's going to be collecting the data, you need to make sure they understand how to do it, how to use that data sheet, because if it doesn't make sense to them, either they're not going to do it at all, or it's not going to be what you're expecting, right? If you're looking at it two different ways, um, the data isn't really going to be valid, probably. So that's the first thing. 
Data sheets can be super simple, can be super complex. Um, I had both when I was teaching, some that were super complex and some that were super simple. Um, but really they should be really tied to the student's goals. So I have a real life example here. Um, so this is a student with gaps in reading fluency and vocabulary, right? And we have a fluency goal. We want him to get to 95 words correct per minute using a fifth grade passage. And a vocabulary goal, we're going to use his um, science lessons because we, there's no such thing as SDI in science or social studies, but we can use um, like a science text to work on comprehension or something. Here we're using science terms to work on vocabulary. And we want the student to identify grade level science terms with 50% accuracy over three consecutive presentations. This is not the best goal I've ever written. Um, it's like a never ending goal, right? How many science terms are you going to? <laughs> it, it could never really be mastered because there's no end in sight. So, Jennifer, yeah. uh, Diane got you for your no citations as well. So, uh, no yes. citations. Yes. <laughs> nice job. Thank Diane. you. Wait till, the, wait till we get to the functional one, Diane. I'm going to see if you notice where I messed up on that one. But again, we have been traveling a lot and you know, we're a little toasty. So anyway, at least I figured out this was a never ending goal and <laughs> it isn't really measurable, but you know, here we are, we're gonna measure it anyway. All right, so here are my data sheets and we've taken data for a little bit. So I'm gonna give you a few minutes, maybe not a few minutes, cause I'm not that patient, but a little bit of time I'm not going to explain these to you. I'm just going to have you look at them and maybe tell me one thing you see. If everybody can put one thing in the chat box that you see here. Are you asking whether they're accurate according to what you're teaching us? Whatever, like, whatever you see, anything that stands out to you here, if anything, maybe not. Like, what does the yellow mean? Might be a thing. Are they making progress? That's another question. Yep, some vocabulary words meet that um, goal. Not much progress on reading fluency. Right. Yep, they are maintaining 50 words correct per minute. Yep, that's a thing. Um, the yellow is where they, um, the yellow on the top one for the vocab is, because the goal is identify grade level science terms with 50% accuracy over three consecutive presentations. So I just marked there where they got that term um, correct three times in a row. That's what the yellow is. So they're doing very well on that goal, I would say. The plus minus is, this is a presentation. Did they identify that science term? And I, I know I didn't define how they're identifying it. Are they, you know, given three pictures? Do they have to do a definition? Because I wrote terrible goals for this example. <laughs> but here we are. All right, so let's go on to fluency. There is no progress on fluency. So what do we do about that? So we, we, we want to figure out why. Why is there no progress on fluency, right? If you know the child and you haven't, if you've been working with them a while, you might 
know why it's happening, right? You might have an idea because you know them well and how they work. Um, if they've been working with an ed tech and not you all the time, um, you might wanna spend some time with them. You might wanna spend some time observing the student with the ed tech. You might wanna spend some time actually working with the student and collecting your own data. You might wanna look for patterns, right? Is it is it always on the same day that they have a problem? Is it, I don't know, after lunch? Is it when it's cloudy out? I don't know. Um, maybe you need to change the materials you're using. Maybe you need to um, use a whole different curriculum. But you need to try something, right? The student is not making any progress. You need to try something. And you may need to try a few things. I mean, I would only try one thing at a time, but you know, you try something, nope, that's not working. What else? What is it, you know, about this skill that this child just can't seem to get it? What's what's going on? How can I make this better? You might have to um bring a little team together, right? Maybe have a little sit down with the gen ed teacher, the, I don't know, speech um, path. You know, maybe if you have access to a BCBA, um, who might, and just sometimes just talking it out kind of um, helps whittle that down. So when you do change something though, make sure that you keep track of when you changed it. I always used to put it right in my data sheets so that I could see um, what was happening. So here, as always happened with me, I changed something and bam, look at that, it worked. Um, <laughs> it did not always happen that way, but. Um, so definitely keep track anytime you change anything with the programming so that you can see what effect that has on the data. And also, if you have this kind of data at your fingertips, when it comes time to do progress reports, it takes no time at all to do them. I, when I was, I was kind of a data freak, but um, when I did progress reports, it took me like maybe an hour tops to do a progress report. And we had to write narratives and everything, but I had my data right there. Um, and I know that some people were digging up their data sheets from the whole um, progress reporting period or whatever and trying to figure it all out from that. But um, if you look at it often, you will have it and it'll be easier. I have Any... a quick question. Yes. Um, what is your opinion about taking this kind of continuous data versus just looking, um, you know, every so often. Uh, so for example, I'm an OT, I'm always looking at, for example, how they're writing, how they're responding to my interventions, but it's not every day or even necessarily every week that I'm pulling mm -hmm. classroom writing samples and doing right. the like looking, you know, I usually like actually count the letters that they've like formed or aligned correctly. You know, it's kind of involved. So I don't do that like like this, like every single time, right? right. So what is your opinion on on that? That's okay. So I I was an FLS teacher and I had all of my kids had one-to-one -one ed techs and they walked around all day with data sheets taking data. And every single day I would take the data and put it into my spreadsheets. Um so it hurts me to say, but no, you don't have to do that. <laughs> do I? Um, whatever works for you, you know, if you, mm -hmm. and, and also the amount of time you wait to see if they're making progress, like how long do you wait? How long do you know that you need to change something? That's going to be different. It's going to be different for every child. And it might be different for the same child working on different skills. Right, you know that yeah, this that is a harder sense. skill. It might take them a little longer, so I might want to give them a little more time on that before I go changing things. So it, it really comes down to your knowledge of the student and your style and 
um, kind of your knowledge of the data, really. You'll know how often you need to do it in order to track things and um, kind of get a hold of things before it just gets out of control, before it's the end of the marketing period. And they're like, oh my God, this kid made no progress at all. You'll know. Yeah. I know yeah, that exactly. sounds like a cop out, exactly. but it's yeah. really different for every kid and every skill and every teacher. So there's your non answer. All right. That was a good question, though. We get that a lot. So um, I have, I'm not going to get into quite as much detail with this, but I have a functional example that I'll tell you. I know I put it on the academic part of the IP, but you know. Um, so this is a student who, who um, doesn't complete his work. So we are gonna teach him to follow a prepared checklist. So this is where maybe his gen ed teacher is gonna make a checklist for him for you know larger assignments or something. And then once he masters that, once he's able to follow the checklist, we're gonna teach him to make his own checklist maybe, right? So that's the next step. But right now we're just going to teach him to follow a checklist that is prepared for him to get him to at least complete some of his work. So that can be, that this data sheet can be pretty complex or it can be super simple or it can be somewhere in the middle. Um, it's really gonna depend on how much time you have to take the data um, and how deep you wanna dig into it. So this is like the simplest one where you would just put, okay, on March 13th, they were working on a rough draft for a writing prompt. I was able to go into the classroom and watch him to see if he used this, if he, you know, if he was using this checklist and he was so plus, right? That's like the most basic data you can take there, right? You Maybe you wanna track how many times did he refer to it? Or did he need prompting to refer to it? Or did he actually finish his work? So you might wanna do those, track those things as well um, to help you identify where the breakdowns are or anything, but that's really your call, right? How much data do you want? And I would change my data sheets sometimes if, oh, I, I don't have enough here. I need to, you know, I need more than this to be able to know. Or um, my ed techs are not understanding this at all. Maybe I can change it in a way that it will make sense to them and I could still get what I need, that kind of thing. But this would be the most basic um, for this goal. And if you only have, um, an hour a week that you can go into the classroom and take data on this kid, this might be all you do, right? This, it, it's really, we know that that is a big deal. We hear that a lot when we are out visiting schools that how do you take data on these kids that are in the gen ed classroom all day? And the answer is you have to find time to go in there and it can be an hour a week. It can be an hour every two weeks. Um, but there has to be some time when you can go in and take data. The gen ed teachers probably are not gonna take data for you and it's, they have you know, 20 other kids that they're watching so they don't always have their eyes on this kid. Um, we were in one district where the director said they wanted to hire an ed tech that just goes around to different classrooms taking data all day. And I volunteered to do that job because that's my dream job, that'd be awesome. <laughs> if we could all have that, right? Somebody to just run around and take data for us because I know that nobody has time to do that. All right, so. Just a quick recap, um, the data sheet has to make sense to the person collecting data, but it also has to give you what you need so that you can analyze it. Look at it often. 
often enough that you can tell whether the child is making progress or not before that reporting period ends. Um, if they're not making progress, change something. And you might have to try a few things. You might have to get a team together and talk it over. But it, your data really has to drive your programming um, because if you do end up in due process, it is gonna come back to hurt you. Um, and your kids won't be making progress, maybe. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. We don't know. We won't know because we won't have the data. So there we go. That's all I got. Any questions? And I have a question for all of you. This was very basic. We're trying to keep it at the um, more of a basic level. The more complex data collection that you would do in a self-contained classroom are, um, yes, put the goal on the data sheet, perfect, because then you know what you're measuring. Um, our feeling with the self-contained classrooms is that those teachers know this because that's their life, right? They have these kids all day, they have ed techs, they have the ability to take this data. So they're probably doing this. They probably have um, experience with ABA. Maybe they have access to a BCBA. So our feeling, the way we're looking at it is those self-contained, um, classrooms, they already know this, and we're kind of trying to gear this to more resource room-ish teachers. So I would like some feedback on that personally. Do you want to go deeper? Do you want more um, resource room type examples, or do you want more like follow a visual schedule type, you know, use a break card type kind of examples. So just throwing that out there because we are kind of making assumptions here and we want to make sure that we are giving you what you need, basically. Um, so I'm going to go through the resources, the procedural manual, very good for writing IEPs or anything um, DOE required forms, any of the forms. Muser, near and dear to our heart. If you'd like some light bedtime reading because you can't fall asleep, you'll be asleep before half a page. This is a link to our IEP quick reference document. It's not that quick. It is um, 14 pages long, but it's smaller than the procedural manual and it gives you everything that we look at when we come on site and what makes those areas compliant. And this link or QR code will bring you to a feedback form. We use your feedback. We love your feedback. Please give feedback. And you will also get a contact hour for being here. And Carly just put that link in the chat. And what is your favorite re for resource for creating data sheets? My favorite resource is myself because I'm a control freak. Um, so I'm going to throw that to Ashley or Carly if they have any. <laughs> um, I can just say I also used to like to make my own because I came from a special purpose private background. And so it was very specific what I wanted to capture. Um, but as I moved into kind of a mixed use classroom, um, I did, I don't know if I should say this or not, but I'm going to say it anyway. Teachers Pay Teachers does have some great editable resources that you can find. Some of them are free, some of them are inexpensive, um, but they have a ton of data sheets that could be edited. Um, I would say for my purposes, they were a little bit basic, but they might be good for like a gen ed kid with a quick check-in. Um, or um, And then there was one other thing. Oh, one other uh, kind of question for you guys, but also an idea. A lot of people have been talking to us about using digital resources for data collection. So Google Classroom, um, that I am not proficient in because um, I was old school and like to write everything down. Um, but we have heard some people that were feeling successful using Google Classroom check-ins and um, data sheets in that way. So um, I'm not sure who to ask about that, but 
um, there is stuff out there for that resource. So that's what I got. Thanks, and, Ashley. Yeah, and I, when I was doing functional goals, like behavior goals for my students, like I created my own data sheets because they were very specific depending on what the student needed to work on for their goal. Um, but I used like Google Sheets or Excel and tracked the data and because then there's a tool in there that you can use to graph the data as well. So I would do that as far as behavior when I was looking more at academics, um, it all depended on what I was using at the time. Like I had some Spire data sheets that I would use to collect specific information on um, data that I was collecting that way. But even like, I mean, it, it just all depends on what you're teaching academically. Um, and let's say you're teaching accuracy for reading passages. Um, I would just pull like a running record. I would grab a level, you know, the level book that the student was reading at, pull a cold passage, get about a hundred words, see how the accuracy was. Um, so there wasn't even really a sheet that I needed. It was more just me counting and dividing. So, I mean, I think it all really depends on what you're collecting your data on as far as how that data sheet is going to look. So Kimberly, you are using Goldbook. Are there, um, does Goldbook make data sheets for you? Yeah, they're usually suggested um, when you're looking up like present level or trying to write a goal or something, they will mm -hmm. give you um, sometimes like a blank one or they'll actually put the goal right in there specifically it. what it is for the IEP you're using it for. Nice. That is a great resource. I didn't know about that. So thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. These are just links to different um, places on our website, different resources. Um, that second link is we record all of these and put them out on our website. Um, don't worry about talking because the only person visible in the recording is the ASL interpreter. So I like that. Um, <laughs> all right, yeah, but if you if you go and watch the recordings, you will still get a contact hour certificate. So feel free. This is how to get in touch with DOE, find DOE online. And this is all of our, woo, there it is. All of our um, email addresses. If you have questions, if you have a goal, you're struggling to come up with a data sheet or any kind of questions, if you're struggling to write a goal, let us know. Don't send us an IEP, please, but just send us a little hypothetical goal. And we are happy to work with you on any of that. So thank you all very much for coming.